we start with the exciting topic of AI and uh, deep tech. Until a couple of years ago, AI seemed to be in the realm of uh, science fiction, but all of a sudden, it seems to be prevailing in every walk of life. Who thought that uh, one could just use your face to walk into the airport and get onto a plane? Digi Yatra is pretty cool. And who thought we could have machine translation in real time? You know, last week, I was in a WebEx session, and I have a difficulty in understanding Englishmen speak English. So I put on the captions, and I was following on that. And then I realized that there is real-time translation in Tamil, Kannada, Malayalam, etc. It was like real fun. Who thought that would happen, right? Or um, kids doing their homework using ChatGPT. I was myself introduced to ChatGPT in a PAFI forum by our consumer affairs secretary who kind of introduced me to that and I have since been hooked on and I who thought I'll be writing English poetry using ChatGPT. That's who's happening, right? Uh, so the power of AI and deep tech is immense and therefore is also concerns about misuse, leading to question on um, what to regulate, how much to regulate, would it stifle innovation and so on and so forth. To discuss this, we have a great panel. We've got Abhishek, Sandeep, and Surat. And to moderate, we have our good friend Sukumar. Like uh, Harish said, uh, AI is a buzzword. And uh, like with all buzzwords, the unfortunate thing is people are already speaking about misuse when there is not even enough use. Right? I mean, so I, I think uh, you first need to figure out uh, what this animal is, uh, how to use it. Um, and, and then uh, create frameworks for it um, because people are already speaking about the need to regulate it, the need to legislate it, and, and you can do all these things uh, as and when things come. And, and uh, um, we have a, a panel here uh, which has got representatives who will agree when I say that if you, if you look at Europe, for instance, which, which is probably the most regulated environment when it comes to tech, um, a lot of their laws, including the DMA and the DSA, have proven to be extremely stifling of innovation because they should have given the technology time to breathe, time to grow before doing the kind of things that they are doing. So I'm quite happy that our own approach to regulation in this country, still in its nascency, but very, very light touch so far. And, and fortunately, we have policymakers in place who uh, accept the fact that it needs to be nimble, it needs to be flexible, it needs to be light. So I'm going to uh, try and uh, break this up into uh, three or four parts. The first part, I'm going to ask each one of our panelists, uh, starting with Abhishek, to tell us about AI in their work. Because I think it's important that all of us understand how they use AI in what they do. Uh, and we have Abhishek, uh, who's the managing director and CEO um, of uh, DIC and NEGD. So we, he will give us a great perspective. And, and you should listen closely to him, because uh, what he does actually affects all our lives in many ways. Uh, we have Sandeep from Microsoft, who will go next. And uh, we all know that Microsoft is doing lots of interesting things with AI. So I'm hoping he'll give us some perspective. And then we have Subrat Bhushan from GAN AI, um, interesting AI company, um, does a lot of work with uh, Indian consumer product companies. So he will give us a perspective of how AI um, is changing what he does, or how AI is the basis of what he does. And, um, and then we will move into other slightly more sticky issues like uh, regulation and misuse and deep fakes, because you know everyone thinks of AI and they think of these uh, negative things. But, but I think, like I said, it's very important that we understand the lay of the land and we understand the positive things that we can achieve with it before we get into the other issues. How AI is being used at the workplace, how AI is being used by us, and how AI, the government is using for making life easier for citizens. We all have been using AI, right? It's right, correct that after the last one year or so, it has become like more talked about. But in some form or the other, whether we are watching YouTube videos or whether we are watching Netflix, when you get the recommendations, it's all some AI algorithm at work. So AI has been around for a long time. Only thing we have started realizing and giving it a tag more recently. So 
when it comes to the government, uh, very often what we do is that uh, AI is being used in several sectors, especially with regard to in healthcare for predicting diseases where you can't send a specialist. For example, there have been uh, solutions developed uh, in partnership with the, with the state governments and startups like, for example, Nirmaya, wherein they developed a solution wherein you could take scanned images of uh, and, uh, and detect breast cancer or use AI for detecting tuberculosis or use AI for, uh, for, uh, for looking at X-ray images and determining whether it might re result in uh, tuberculosis or not or for cataract scanning like the Tamil Nadu did the, for that. So what it does is that instead of sending a specialist doctor in every village to do that, you can scan the images and identify who are the more likely to have. So that based on training, uh, training AI models with data sets that are available, it's doing that. Similar examples in agriculture has been there where in Maharashtra, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh have used it for detecting cotton ballworm diseases and other diseases that they are there. You can, farmers can just upload a leaf, image of a leaf and you can uh, predict whether uh, the disease is there or not. It's like Bihar, uh, there have been experiments where it will be used for predicting floods. For example, you look at the water levels, you look at the rainfall data which is coming and then predict <coughs> when, whether the floods will come or not. And if such information will be available, if even two to three days in advance, it can mean a lot to save lives and uh, property. We have been using AI during COVID a lot. Like the MyGov help desk, which was built and launched on WhatsApp, it uh, transformed communications. People could actually ask questions in their own, uh, the way they wanted to phrase unstructured queries and get a response back with regard to any query that they have. Over a period of time now, we started using voice-enabled services. Surat uh, excels in building the product, the, his company has developed greatly and he will talk you more about that. But what we have been trying to do, like Omang is an app on which uh, we can access uh, almost 2,000 public services on a mobile interface. But therein, what we realized that many people struggle to actually download an app or enter a CAPTCHA or a URL, and they would prefer a voice-based interface. What we have done is that you can go to the Umang app and, hey, Umang, uh, what is the status of my driving license? Uh, how do I get a passport? How do I get a, uh, what is the status of my scholarship? Any query that you do, and you get a voice, you reply back in your mother tongue on voice. That's another example wherein AI is being used for uh, LP kind of processing. Hashini project, which is much talked about more recently, wherein uh, it's been used to train the data sets in multiple Indian languages to provide seamless speech-to-speech, -speech, voice to uh, speech-to-text translations, already available on Play Store and App Store. Many of you might be using it also. Using the Bhashini interface, there was a project that was taken up by our team in association with IT Madras and some startups. And they came up with a solution called Jugal Bandi, wherein you can actually make a query on a WhatsApp interface and ask, eligibility based discovery of schemes ki like main kisan hu mujhe sarkar se kya kuch mil sakta and then it will query the my scheme apis and the ashini apis and give you a reply back in voice this was in fact demoed to satya narela in january and he has been talking about it at various forums so several applications of ai and now we have also started using it in our day to day work like for example chat gpt to writing long letters suppose uh, harish invites me for this forum and i said okay i want to come i can either send him a text if I have to send him a business mail properly drafted, then I will just say the reply to this mail saying that I will come. Then it will do, oh, dear Harish, thank you for inviting me, all that blah, blah, blah. And then chat GPT will create for that and uh, it will be faster, quicker than me giving a dictation to my staff and sending it to him. So multiple applications, both for public service and for uh, in our personal uh, lives and personal work that we are using. Great. I, I think that is a good introduction. I have a lot of questions for you, but I will wait for the other speakers to finish. Uh, uh, thanks, Sukumar. Uh, I think, as uh, you know, Abhijit mentioned, uh, the uh, possibilities on AI are immense. Uh, you know, starting from healthcare, uh, as the examples he gave, to education. Right? Think about uh, each each student has a different uh, learning curve, and think about uh, you know a, a scenario where each student can learn at his or her own pace. Uh, with personalized tutors, that that is something AI can enable, right? Similarly, uh, you know, material sciences. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, climate change. So many of the things which uh, we, we we thought will need a, a lot of uh, years to get solved, AI enables that. Closer to home, as you mentioned, Sukumar, on you know how how are we uh, using and how can we use currently? I think the foremost thing is productivity increase, 
for everyone. Uh, you know, whether it's a knowledge worker, whether it's an artist, whether it's, uh, you know, someone else, just shifting the mundane tasks to uh, AI tools and freeing up your time to do more deeper thinking and deeper meaning work. I think uh, AI enables that. And, uh, you know, some examples of, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, the uh, Bing chat function, which is available in Bing now, uh, and you know the the backend infra, as Abhishek ji mentioned, you know the the Jugalbandi project or the Bashani project. I think these are fundamental life-altering things for citizens of India. And I think AI's promise uh, is largely delivered when it's inclusive, when it's accessible, and when it does good for the society at large. And there is no other place like India which will benefit most from the AI revolution, right? So I think as we go forward, you will see more solutions coming up. Uh, you know, you will have hear about Copilot, where uh, you can, uh, you know, convert uh, meeting notes into a thank you letter. You can convert meeting notes into a PowerPoint presentation. But as all AI things, uh, you know, why we are calling it Copilot is we believe fundamentally that uh, AI has to be human centric. There has to be human intervention at the center of it. AI cannot take over what you do, what we all do, but can help us do it better. I mean, I've always felt as a moderator in such events that it'll be good if AI takes over what one does, <laughs> right? I mean, it just makes life so much easier. Um, thank you, Sandeep. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Sukumar, for having us here. Um, I think. For a country like India specifically, right? Like there is no way to scale service delivery without uh, the help of AI. Like, for example, uh, you know, Sandeep mentioned uh, education as a sector. For a country like India, you know, with 1.5 billion uh, population, you just cannot have the same level of education in tier three, tier four cities that you can have, for example, in tier one cities, right? Like the best teachers are not incentivized uh, to sort of go to tier three, tier four cities and help children that they are in the best coaching institutions or in, you know, in tier one cities where they paid crores to do that. Uh, and with AI, we can help sort of bridge that gap where every student can, for example, get personalized attention, sort of can level the playing field where every student, every child is sort of getting the same attention from a teacher that is available to answer their doubts, that is available 24 seven to answer and address their queries, and personally teach them and overcome doubts that they're having. Same thing, you know, Sir Abhishek Sir mentioned about uh, healthcare as well, right? Like you just cannot have enough doctors to cater to a population at our scale. Uh, can you help uh, AI to help essentially diagnose triage and then send the most serious cases uh, where they need, uh, you know, healthcare attention? Uh, when I was at Facebook, uh, we were sort of training models to accelerate MRI scans. So I don't know how many of you have ever gotten an MRI scan done, uh, but for those of you and take about an hour to, you know, for example, even scan any modality. So we were essentially using form of generative AI to essentially help accelerate that and reduce that to about 15 minutes, increasing the time of an MRI machine at the rate by 4x. Um, what our company at Gander AI specifically does is focusing on generative AI, where we're focusing on content creation for different use cases, right? And there, the value proposition is that the amount of content that you're watching, for example, on Netflix, when you're watching on YouTube, watching on Instagram Reels is essentially today being created by humans. Um, and essentially these uh, companies are ranking them. Uh, but the future of this is essentially fully generative, right? Like, can I truly understand what makes me laugh, what makes me cry, what sort of you know evokes different emotions in me? Then can I generate music, can I generate audio, can I generate video, which are personally catered to me, which can, for example, you know, really engage me, can you know, sort of evoke different emotions in me, it's truly personalized to the type of content that I want to watch uh, and you know, enable that for everyone. And I think in all of these sectors, including healthcare, including education, including content generation, uh, to solve problems at scale at about 1.5 billion population level, I think we'll have to use AI in different ways to help scale service delivery everywhere. You know, uh, underlying all of this and underlying all of AI is really a lot of data. Because the reason why AI is able to do what it does it, it is because, because of big data. So, you know, there's a certain sequence in which all these things happened, and, and without big data, we wouldn't have been able to uh, even get down to AI. And 
speaking of data, I think the critical thing here is uh, the usage of data. Because if you prevent AI from continuing to access and use and leverage data, its ability to learn is going to be limited. And I don't know how many of you are aware of this uh, huge controversy that a bunch of writers have created. Uh, Suvrat is smiling. Uh, which is, you know, uh, teaching AI to write by reading the books by famous writers. And, and uh, writers are aghast, right? I mean, so there's a database where you can go, if you're a writer, you can put your book name and see whether the language model used your book to learn how to write. And people have a problem with this, uh, which is, at, you know, at a fundamental level, level, I find this a little strange simply because uh, there are many ways in which we learn to write. But uh, one of the most important aspects of learning how to write is, is, is reading. We all, as humans, no artificial intelligence, right? I mean, we are all natural intelligence. Uh, more natural than intelligence, but still natural intelligence. And uh, we all learn to write because we read books. And, and suddenly you are saying that AI can't read these same books and learn how to write. So, so the use of data is one of these very, very contentious areas that has emerged. So I would, I'm going to now reverse the order. I'm going to start with Subrat first because I, I think, he, you know, he, this is an area which touches him, touches all of us, but touches him more closely than it does anyone else. And then we'll go to Sandeep and then we'll come to Abhishek. I want all of them to weigh in on this. Absolutely. I, I think this is a very hot topic of debate requires, you know, public to weigh in. So the two sides of the argument are as follows, right? Uh, like on the use of uh, data in training AI models, the argument that Sukumar put forward is that everybody learns uh, from past data that exists. Us as humans, you know, learn uh, by reading books, learn from authors that we draw inspirations from, you know, like learn from music from other artists. And it's reflective in our works as well. Like, you know, in different authors, you'll find, you know, traces and signs of, of other authors that they've learned from that they admire and respect. And you'll find signs of their work and their writing. You'll find the same in music artists as well. That you'll find traces and signs of music artists that they've learned from, that they admire, that they take inspiration from. And the same would be true for AI models as well, right? Like the, that the content that they generate would have unmistakable signs that this is where it's learned from and this is where it's uh, you know learning and drawing inspiration from. Um, and uh, the, the one side of the debate is that there should be nothing wrong uh, with it. Uh, that should be allowed and everyone should be allowed to train AI models on existing work. The other side of the debate essentially is that there's an artist uh, who makes a livelihood uh, because of his unmistakable signs. People pay, pay for him uh, to, you know, design, uh, to design pieces of content which sort of have his trademark style. And tomorrow, an AI model which comes in, which has been trained on his work or his or her work, can essentially replicate that style and flood the market with content. And, um, the, and you know, the artist who earlier used to make a livelihood from doing this is no longer being compensated um, and uh, suddenly may not have a livelihood um, anymore uh, to be able to do this, right? Uh, I think um, like that, that's essentially what the two sides of the uh, argument uh, boil down to, that how do you, for example, um, you know, ethically compensate artists who may be out of a livelihood. Um, I think uh, my take on this essentially is that, you know, if you take a 2000 uh, year view on this whole debate, right? Uh, 2,000 years ago, an artist used to be someone who used to, you know, make his own uh, canvas and used to make his own paints and, you know, might be making his own uh, brush as well uh, and then, you know, creating a piece of art or creating a piece of content. Um, today, you don't expect an artist to do that. Uh, like, you know, the artist is procuring all of uh, his or her tools uh, and is simply using his power of imagination and power of mind to bring the art to life by, by, by painting it. Um, you know, um, tomorrow, if I'm using uh, an AI algorithm to sort of, you know, essentially conceptualize and bring to life what I have in mind, uh, and, you know, the tools at hand are not the skill at which I'm drawing uh, with the brush, but, you know, rather how articulately uh, I can, you know, bring to life what I have in mind and creating a piece of art, uh, that is also the definition of an artist. You know, I think over time, the definition of an artist changes. Um, you know, 2,000 years ago, like, I was an artist because I had the ability to manufacture paint. I had the ability 
you know, like, you know, have the best brushes and I could design that and create art. Today it is, you know, the skill at which I can paint. Tomorrow it might be the skill at which how well I can, you know, articulate my piece of art and, you know, bring to life using a mesh of AI algorithms, etc. Uh, there's going to be a period uh, of, you know, some turmoil while all of the dust settles in and people realize a new reality in which, but I think that's where the future uh, is definitely going to be headed, where artists are going to embrace AI algorithms to, you know, in incorporate them uh, in the pieces of art and content that they're creating. Thank you. Uh, that was a very balanced view. Uh, so, you know, uh, taking from what Subrat said, I think largely uh, as AI applications get developed and the models get trained, uh, it's imperative that the developers are transparent about how the models have been trained. And if the models have been trained on publicly available data and they are declaring it, you know, I think it's absolutely fine. Because for models to be effective, they have to be trained well. If they are not trained well on enough data sets, then it's useless. For example, uh, the text to speech uh, or speech to text kind of a thing, it has to be trained on multiple data sets. But when I, for example, use it, or Abhishek Ji uses it on his personal you know, computer, it gets trained from a, it has been trained with the larger model, but while converting text to speech, it is using only the data which is on his PC or my PC or my system. So it is not you know, using uh, my data for someone else's use or putting someone else's data into my use. The, but the models have been trained. But it is important that it is transparency is maintained on how the models have been trained. I think the second most very important thing is for citizens, for users, that as developers and deployers of AI models, how do we label or watermark content which has been generated by AI so that people are not confused? I think we propagate that a lot, that if a content has been generated by AI, if a painting has been generated by Dali, or if some other engine has made the painting, there has to be a watermark saying it's AI generated. I think those recent examples, right, some people posted some fake pictures, uh, and uh, when people tested it, it was found to be AI generated. So as this becomes prevalent, that content which is generated by AI has been labeled and watermarked, I think a lot of this confusion will go away. And, you know, people will have less anxiety about original work, you know, if I as a writer or I as a painter am doing, or something has been made by AI, but it has been watermarked as made by AI on this date, uh, it, it, it changes the equation quite a bit. So, so in fact, uh, most of it, uh, what has uh, already been sent by, said by Sourat and by Sandeep, but what I will say is like, uh, what is AI? Nothing but a piece of software, just a tool. And if you look at the overall evolution in way of life that we have seen, read about, seen over a period of uh, long period, he talked about 2000 years, of a longer period, whether it was fire or wheel or internet or printing press, they all have been disruptive. They have changed the way we have been looking things uh, as they exist. So similarly, this generative AI and uh, generative AI has made AI being noticed much more than what it had ever been. It's just like a stage that we are in the evolution of technology wherein th some things become to be much more simpler. Learning has become simpler. But as it has happened across, whether it was invention of printing press, it didn't it stop writers to think of new things or write some things. He mentioned about the analogy about printers and tools. So it's just a tool that we have today. And it is, of course, uh, uh, transformed the way we do things, uh, enables people who could not do things earlier to do these things better. At the same time, when it comes to a balance between whether uh, the AI is mimicking humans and will it be able to do things which humans do better than humans, I, my personal view is that uh, the imagination power or the thinking or the cognitive skills that a human mind has, till a few years till the AI will acquire that. And what will happen is that those writers and those painters and those artists, musicians, may end up using these very AI tools to create something which the AI cannot create. If this conflict between uh, the, uh, the writers and uh, creative people, I always have been of the belief that the humans will prevail and they will better use this technology to make, uh, to create better things. 
as far as this whole thing of uh, sharing of revenue and writers getting perturbed, they also became good writers because they learned some things from some other source. That debate, I don't think, has too much of merit, but ultimately it will evolve. If they can kind of copyright and they can say that I will not let anyone read my books and I will like put a password protect and then charge a royalty for that, there are models there also. There are people who, uh, like even for uh, reading articles from the instant time, sometimes I have to go to a paywall. <laughs> <laughs> so if tomorrow, tomorrow somebody puts like a barrier on that, then maybe the AI people, the, uh, the AI engineers who are writing code using text to create a better text, they might need to share some revenue with that. So it's a stage in the evolution of technology, and I think it will settle down. We should not get too worried about uh, humans losing out. We should be worrying about humans, and especially uh, for a country like India, the, since we are the tech garage for the world. How do we ensure that our engineers, our workforce, our IT, ITS sector, our uh, youth, they have the necessary skills to survive in the age that we are headed? Um, I mean, I want to start off by telling you that anything of value always has a price, <laughs> right? Which is why we have a paywall. Um, but I, I like this discussion we've been having on uh, content creation, especially simply because um, what we are seeing with a lot of uh, AI tools, uh, right? I mean, including ones like Mid Journey and this, a newsroom does use some AI tools. Um, but they're all still, if you understand what I mean, mechanical. They, they still need prompts. It's not as if they spontaneously create stuff, right? I mean, so, so the, you, and your ability to get things out of it is directly a function of how smart your own instructions to it are at this point in time. Um, and as Sandeep pointed out, transparency and disclosure is, is of course very important. But, but the thing about technology is that it, it, it moves so fast um, that at some point in time, what we are speaking about as a hurdle is, is no longer a hurdle. Right? I mean, it, it just crosses over. So a week from now, is it a week from now? A week and a half from now, a song called Now and Then will be released. And uh, I don't know how many of you know of Now and Then. Has anyone heard of this song called Now and Then? So it's the last Beatles song, um, which has been created by, uh, I mean, John sang it, but he did it in a demo tape with along with piano, and there was no technology available in science at that point in time which could separate the two, uh, but they now have. And uh, we have also seen how uh, you know, it is possible to create actors. Um, it, it's possible to do it. Harry Fisher, right? I mean, uh, after she died. Um, so it, it is possible to actually continued leveraging big brands that exist, like the Beatles, like the Star Wars franchise. And uh, I think the bigger ethical issues will start coming up related to content. There are, of course, larger ethical issues related to life and health and other things, but related to content, the bigger ethical issues will start coming out from there. I, I don't know how many of you have seen this Twitter handle called Wodow's Tweets which is basically some smart guy sitting somewhere who puts out tweets that sound just like P.G. Wodos. It's very easy to teach a piece of software to write like P.G. Wodos, right? I mean, you just make it read all his books and then over a period of time, it will start generating that. At which point in time, you know, is it all right to do that? Because you're leveraging a certain thing that's there. Subrat, any thoughts? Yeah, absolutely. Um, like this is something that we think about almost on a daily basis, right? So I actually have a different view than what um, Sandeep mentioned earlier, right? Like I think the onus of content uh, that should be marked should not be on AI-generated content, but actually on authentic, unaltered content. So for example, if for example, you're giving testimony in a courthouse, um, like, you know, there should be a very easy framework to, you know, digitally sign raw footage uh, that has been shot directly from a camera and unaltered, right? I think like that, that's probably like what the future of this is going to be, that most smartphones and camera devices are going to digitally sign footage as they're going to be recorded. Uh, and you know, that watermark 
is going to be authentic, that this footage is unaltered. Um, the flip side of marking AI content is essentially um, that even if you use autocorrect in your writing, that's a small piece of AI software uh, which is correcting, uh, you know, uh, which is correcting what you're writing. Um, if you're using an image editing software to compose different images and create a collage uh, of images, that's using some small rudimentary AI software to create images. Um, I might be using Midjourney to create the backdrop uh, of an image uh, and then you know placing some content that I have written manually or generated manually. So where do you draw the line between you know this is completely AI generated content versus where I've edited, photoshopped, uh, you know, like made changes to it to create like human generated content. So I think you know like to say that we watermark AI generated content, I would make the argument that any content that we've been putting out in the last ten years has had some um, you know AI modifications, changes, implications, and generations to it, right? So um, I, I think that that's probably not the right way. The right, in my humble opinion, the right way is to you know watermark and authenticate unaltered live uh, content, and then you know understand uh, that you know most content is going to have some sort of generations and modifications done with the help of AI. Um, I think there's again going to be a period of antibodies that people will develop uh, as they see this becomes more commonplace. I think that's you know, humans are very quick uh, to recognize and understand uh, that something is generated and, you know, like, you're amazed by it the first time, but the second time you see it, you understand that it's going to be commonplace. Um, and we should embrace, uh, you, know, AI, AI, you know, the help of AI in all content uh, that we're generating. Okay, I want uh, Abhishek and uh, Sandeep to weigh in on uh, a slightly different version of this. And, and I want to move away from content. Because content is, at the end of the day, really innocuous. I mean, it's harmless. So let's move over to uh, stuff like the trolley problem. And I'm sure you're familiar with the trolley, pro trolley problem, right? I mean, uh, with a sense of philosophical teaching in many universities. So uh, there's a trolley which is barreling down a track, and, and, and there is a young kid who is on one side, there are four people on the other side, some old people there. I mean, and you can have multiple varieties of it. You have. Uh, dogs in one, you have old people in one, you have women in one. I mean, you can just do and And you get to decide um, who lives and who dies. And uh, the, the key question will be, um, what happens when you allow AI to take decisions like this? Because th then the decisions are going to be based on what? And I think that's where the real issue uh, related to AI comes in, right? Because we, we, are you going to, uh, because it will be possible to do that. I mean, um, you take cold clinical decision, much like an IVR does. Right? I mean, you want to speak in English, press one, you want to speak in Hindi, press two. That is exactly how the trolley is going to be redirected five years from now. Probably not even five years from now. It's possible to do it technically two years from now. Good. Uh, uh, you know, segue Sukumar here. And I think one of the things we have been talking about and, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, 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 trying to build, uh, you know, consensus around is that AI is a very broad subject, you know, and as uh, Abhishek Ji also mentioned, it's been around for years. We have been using it, uh, you know, as Surat said, it, it's been used in many, many ways, small ways, big ways. It's suddenly caught attention. Uh, and now we are talking about it, and hence it's very important that we don't get carried away uh, with the hype side of it. Uh, and AI has elements of there are common use AI, you know, applications, AI use cases, and there are uses of AI which can potentially be high risk. And I think from a governance of AI standpoint, on how do we govern AI, uh, all the attention. At, at this stage should be on the high risk side that what are the models which can potentially cause harm and then what do we do to make sure that they do not cause that harm are there enough safety breaks are there uh, you know enough human centric uh, you know elements added to it i'll give you an example and uh, you know brad uses this example a lot that when uh, invention of the lift, the elevator, people were obviously afraid, you know, sitting in a machine going up and down. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, companies put a brake, a handbrake to, to stop the lift 
in the middle of the lift initially. And that gave people confidence, saying, if needed, I can pull the lever and stop it. And I will not, you know, die or it will not fall. And I think that, that safety breaks element of high risk use cases of AI is very important. And I think all the attention for now has to be uh, on high risk cases. You know, one more example, right? The text to speech. Now, text to speech or speech to text kind of a thing is a very different connotation in an office meeting. You know, a word going wrong slightly has no real relevance. But the same speech to text in a doctor to patient conversation can be life altering. Because if one word gets misrepresented and the uh, medicine gets wrongly prescribed, it can be fatal, right? So how do you differentiate? One, one uh, use case is not high risk, one use case is high risk. So I think from a governance of AI standpoint, uh, we have to kind of come together. Uh, obviously, it has to be led by the government, uh, but very, very strong participation from private sector. But how do we define what are the high risk cases, use cases, and then AI applications and models around that, how do they get governed first? And then slowly we move on to the broader use case. So I want to understand from you, what do you think at this point in time, the right kind of policy for AI is going to be um, to ensure that we get what we can out of it, but at the same time uh, dealing with the high risks that uh, Sandeep spoke about. Before I come to that, a quick one on the ethical question that you asked with regard to the trolley problem, the typical standard things with whether we talk, like how do we take decisions when it comes to matter of ethics and whether the decisions being taken by humans themselves will be better than the one taken by AI. In this case also, I think if you have to design an AI model which takes a call on whether you save a child or whether you save an old woman or whether you save, or save a dog or whether you save a working man, they're also like, uh, ultimately the AI model will be trained on similar decisions which have been taken by others in the past. We have millions of people who have been asked in universities, colleges about the philosophical dilemma and these questions. And it has a database on which it is trained. So based on that, it will come to the most logical, most, epic, most uh, basic decision that is there. And in many ways, that decision that it comes, because it has been trained on the past data, might be better than what one individual may think. Uh, in, as an individual, I may think from my own point of view. But that solution might be better. And then you can even tweak it by saying that, what if the AI tool is a woman? How what if it will decide, what if it is the old person, what if it is the Asian, what is the uh, American. So different uh, permutations, combinations you can try on that model and get responses. And I'm sure in such cases, especially the AI tool will be as good as humans and it in no case it will be worse. As far as coming from a public policy perspective and how we are thinking as Harish mentioned, see the sign that especially India and uh, most countries have taken is that we have to have a very delicate balance between innovation and regulation. There was a call by some AI experts and engineers some time back wherein they said that we should halt all AI research and in fact uh, somebody like Jeffrey Hinton also mentioned that and we should kind of limit it otherwise it will cause harm. While causing harm can be a matter of concern but that cannot be a reason for restricting uh, uh, efforts to be made in research and development. AI. Otherwise, it will become something to the bogey that was called for when it came to nuclear technology. When the, yeah. the country which had it, they said that, okay, now NPT, no others, we have it. We are the big five, we have it, and no other country will be allowed to develop that. So we need to, as a country, as India, we need to avoid getting in that kind of situation. We have the world's best talent when it comes to writing AI code. What we need is better access to the data that also we have, and maybe compute. If we are able to do that, we will be able to drive more innovation, build more uh, solutions in the field of AI, and while at the same time, set up frameworks for ethical and responsible uh, usage of AI, guardrails to be prescribed, what the AI can do, what AI cannot do. There's a lot of effort being made globally in, in this direction. We are the incoming chair for the Global Partnership on AI this year. The Global Summit on AI will be held in December in Delhi. So we are in conversation with most member countries there. The UN Secretary General yesterday only announced about the setting up an advisory group on uh, artificial intelligence and it's a multi-stakeholder group. Uh, there are people from India also who are represented there. We will have to ensure that our approach finds function there in the G20 leadership summit also. 
uh, our Prime Minister mentioned that uh, use AI responsibly for social good and use AI for all. Our Finance Minister in the budget has mentioned that make AI in India and make AI for the world. So our approach has been to push forward ethical and responsible usage of AI, bring together international consensus on doing that. Next week, the UK is hosting the AI Safety Summit. In that also the uh, security, safety, ethical issues will be discussed. I am sure we will be able to put forward, especially being the chair for the GP for the next one year, our approach uh, to responsible AI and ensuring that we are able to use AI for social good while taking care of the harmful effects of artificial intelligence. Subrat, do you want to add anything on the policy perspective? Yeah, absolutely. I think it's very heartwarming to hear Abhishek sir say that. Uh, that I think, um, like, I think the regulation part of AI, I think, is overhyped uh, at this point. Right? I, I would make the argument that India became such an IT superpower uh, largely because um, uh, you know there was little uh, sort of uh, regulation and allowed the industry to thrive. And it's very heartwarming to see sir uh, say that as well. Right? Like about the balance uh, between uh, innovation and regulation. I think the industry. Uh, largely should be allowed uh, to self-regulate uh, and sort of come up with, you know, self codes of conduct on, on how to proceed um, in issues like this. At this point where, you know, where government support can really make a difference uh, is in terms of providing access to data, in terms of providing access to compute uh, that is needed uh, to train these large AI models, right? I think the best thing, for example, if, you know, if we can give about, you know, 100,000 GPU clusters to every esteemed a government institution like it sort of just 10x the output of you know research that's happening in the country because research and innovation is going to happen you know whether India can sort of enable and embrace that or can for example stifle um, stifle that by you know putting in too many barriers to entry and putting in too many uh, certifications and regulations uh, that can go through uh, so very glad to hear uh, that you know that uh, sort of uh, that the government and industry are on the same page uh, on this okay um... No, the only point I want to make there, and I'm not going to ask any of the other panelists to respond to this because then, you know, we will eat into one more hour. <laughs> Big Tech has actually set a very bad example on self-regulation. So, you know, when I hear Subrat speak about self-regulation, I know we have some representatives from Big Tech on the stage here. It hasn't really covered itself in glory, at least from... That's my perspective. I'm going to throw the floor uh, so over. just, you know, one uh, minute. Okay. <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, uh, a side point. So uh, we have been at the forefront of saying it has to be regulated and government should regulate it and we'll help. Okay, so. Okay. <laughs> and I think just to one more point on, you know, Abhishek Ji's point that I think this is India's moment to shine. Uh, you know, AI presents that opportunity where Indian startups, Indian companies can build for the world. Uh, and I think this is a like a watershed moment. I think uh, it's heartening to you know hear Abhishek ji saying that all framework and regulations, the way it's been thought through, is pro innovation. Uh, and I think that is what is needed right now, uh, so that uh, you know companies based in India, startups, the talent here, can build for the world. People of my vintage will remember in the 1990s, uh, India won all the beauty contests, Miss World, Miss Universe, and. When IT, uh, Pramod Mahajan mentioned that India is doing very well in IT and beauty because we don't have a Ministry of IT or a Ministry of Beauty. And then later on we had the Ministry of IT. Question is to Abhishek. You said that the IT model, the AI model that will decide what is to be killed or what is not to be killed will be as good or bad as any other human being. But the different Abhishek is that the man, can, the human driver will be prosecuted. Who will prosecute the machine? And second point is, you know, Shubhrat, there is all the people sitting here are from tech. There is not a single consumer association sitting here. Deep tech self-regulation, I entirely agree with Sukumara, hasn't worked, it won't work. If you don't get your act right in the beginning, we as consumers want safety as well as innovation. But we don't want one versus the other. And that is what deep tech has actually shown, that they lie nakedly even in the US parliament about all the things that they have done. This is the result of laissez-faire policy that let technology develop, innovation develop, and there is some kind of a standard correct time when you will start regulating it. It never is. You go out of control and after that, all of our data today resides abroad. By the time developing countries wake up, the big markets have all gone. I believe, therefore, I think I agree with Sukumar, some form of initial regulation, it may be light in form, but is absolutely necessary to keep the guardrails on from the beginning. 
I fully agree with the, the need for guardrails and the need for regulation. Only thing that I mentioned that there has to be a balance and regulation should not be there to restrict innovation. And that has been the hallmark. In fact, he said that not having a Ministry of IT or Beauty, but then, but then again, we have a Ministry of IT, but the Ministry of IT is there to promote innovation at the same time restricting harmful use of technology, whether it's IT or whether it's AI or any other form of uh, use of information technology. As far as the who to prosecute, that's a question that will be asked for multiple uh, scenarios. There are a lot of things that happen. People lose their lives because of a failure of a machine part. So who do you prosecute there? Whether you prosecute the person who designed a brake which failed while driving a car. And again, we are thinking all we are thinking of driverless cars and all. There also, who will you prosecute? Will we go and prosecute uh, Tesla or will you go and prosecute people who manufacture the car? Or will we prosecute a person who is using the, uh, you know, uh, the the uh, device or the machine or the thing for the time being. These are issues which the law and regulation will take care of. And there are numerous examples in, in the legal uh, precedents and cases that are there who has addressed similar cases by use of any other technology. Here it's AI, earlier it has been other technology. Uh, my question is on uh, diversity as an issue that has come up in AI. Uh, you know, uh, Mr. Singh, you said uh, AI is nothing but software, and much of that code has been written by men. Uh, is there cognizance of that issue uh, in the government uh, in India, and are there any measures being taken? Yes, very much. In fact, uh, this uh, bias of AI, because AI is trained on data sets, and if the data sets, input data sets have got bias, whether it's related to gender, or whether it's related to race, or whether it's related to communities or castes in India, those things will be eminent in that. So. The way the responsible and ethical AI framework is designed is that to be aware of this bias and take necessary steps to correct the bias in that. Like in fact in chat GPT, when it came we told chat GPT write a poem about say an IS officer. It immediately came, he is hard working, he is doing that. I asked it to write a poem about a teacher. She is a very hard working, she is... So because the background data that it has, it has that kind of bias which is existing in the existing data, that gets reflected. But when we think of that, when aware of that, then we are able to correct that. So that becomes very, very important when we design AI algorithms. So we have discussed about the ethical aspects of AI. So my question is related with the political aspect. So there is a there will be a difference between those who are using AI and creating content and those who have no access to AI. And in the books of Yuval Noah Harari, you have mentioned about it. So in an AI age, what will be the role of a government and the market to ensure a fair race between those who have access and those who don't have access to AI. Again, this is a typical issue of uh, inclusion, digital inclusion, and why only AI? In fact, even when we design an online solution, having access to a smartphone or a laptop or a computer, or access to connectivity, or access to skills to uh, navigate a uh, digital service, that also becomes a very, very important point. Or for that example, making a service available in various languages. So. Digital inclusion has been the core of uh, India's Digital India strategy right from the beginning. Whether it was setting up common service centers wherein you can go and get assisted access in case you did not have the ability to, to access a service on your own device. Or uh, making services available in various languages or as I mentioned making services available with voice so that people without the necessary digital skills could also access those services. And now as we go for uh, AI and democratizing AI access what we will need to really ensure is that that uh, our engineers and our students and our researchers should also need to have access to the same level of compute to which some of the other countries and other companies have. Like for example, we have our fastest supercomputer that we have is the Arawat and the Paramsiddhi uh, with, uh, with CDAC, which has got around 600 GPUs. And if you look at like uh, OpenAI, which built ChatGPT, they are like of the order of 30,000 GPUs and that. So we do not, so we need to ensure that Indian students, Indian researchers, Indian startups also get access to that. So there is a move, there is an initiative in order to ensure that we also set up large scale compute infrastructure, make it available on an equitable basis, on a low cost basis to our entrepreneurs uh, so that they can also build large language models and they can also build products which can uh, transform the way uh, many of these companies are doing. So the question here comes to same uh, my colleague from PCW mentioned about the biasing of the algorithms. I know there was a, some work which I think Department of Telecom or TEC was doing uh, on validation of those algorithms. 
Now, it's not about India. I think we see all over the world. How is India going to take a lead in ensuring that the, 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 the algorithms are being designed across uh, so that they set, set, take a leadership in terms of validation of those algorithms and set a tone in the sense that it doesn't bring bias in those algorithms? So, see, like, uh, as I mentioned, we are, uh, this is not a India-only challenge. This is a global challenge, and all countries of the world are conscious of these challenges. So we are uh, signatory to the UNESCO's uh, ethical AI frame, assessment framework, wherein it lays down the checklist or lays down the, the way to assess an AI solution, whether it confirms to all the ethical and the regulatory guidelines which are required for responsible use of AI. We are also, uh, uh, as I've mentioned, the lead chair for, uh, for the global partnership on AI, wherein we are discussing with the 29 member countries with regard to how do we bring together the common framework for regulating AI. So OECD's AI framework is there, which was adopted by G20, and it was also mentioned in this year's G20 summit about doing that. The UK AI Safety Summit, which uh, the British Prime Minister is hosting next week, wherein India will be represented by our minister, and we will put forward what are our concerns, what are our ways, and how do we work with the global community in trying to come up with that. The UN Secretary General's announcement yesterday about setting up the advisory group, which is going to address many of these issues, will also be taken up uh, at the International Forum. So what I can only say is that uh, maybe in December, there will be some consensus with regard to this and how do we ensure that whatever solutions are developed are confirming to the common understanding that's there amongst all the key stakeholders. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Abhishek, uh, Sukumar, Sandeep, and Savrut for joining us on this very, very important uh, session today on deep tech, AI, and emerging policy landscape. On behalf of PASI, I believe the key takeaways for us include that AI certainly has phenomenal potential uh, to bridge the access divide so far as education, healthcare is concerned, 5G powered remote, AI based surgeries will radicalize healthcare. AI will also help drive citizen engagement, digital literacy. Linguistic diversity in AI will fuel and accelerate digital adoption. Of all the potential benefits of AI in multiple sectors, I, I believe that AI can play a very, very critical and important role in, mitig in mitigating climate change. This area, I think, needs greater attention and focus. Finally, applied ethics in AI needs to be human-centric. Content generated by AI needs to be labeled and watermarked to retain distinction between original human content and AI. Finally, discussions on AI governance on the high risk side will increasingly take center stage, uh, which is evident from our session here today. A balance between safety, innovation, and light touch regulation to protect the consumer. I'm just wondering my last thoughts before I call on Harish. What kind of a role AI will play in areas of conflict? I think that's, that's a thought I'd leave for the next PASI session. On a positive note, I asked ChatGPT, will AI replace public policy professionals? And the answer is no. So we can... <laughs>